When the Spanish surrealist Salvador Dali was asked to name his favorite animal, he replied, filet of soul. He also said, I am surrealism, which he then defined as the systemization of confusion. Dali was as talented at self-promotion and money-making as he was at painting. As was pointed out by the French poet André Breton, an anagram for Dali's name is Avida Dollars, a hybrid Spanish-English term for eager for dollars. Surrealism, which Breton had founded in 1922, was a style of art and literature that grew out of an unlikely marriage of art with psychoanalysis. Its artistic parent was a Zurich-based anti-art movement called Dada. Dada began as a protest of World War I, and deliberately tried to provoke its audiences through chance, nonsense, errors, and contradiction, in other words, by the systemization of confusion. During the same war, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic method of free association, to say aloud while lying on a couch, whatever comes to mind, had been used with some success to treat the victims of trench warfare. Working with shell-shocked soldiers in a hospital, it was Breton who saw the connection between Freud's famous talking cure and the Dada's nonsense-producing techniques like automatic writing, radical juxtaposition, and the exquisite corpse. But the link between Freud and Breton was direct, and they actually met in Vienna in 1921. Dali also met Freud in London in 1938, in a meeting that, according to Dali, was an utter failure. Freud was old and ill by then. Only a month earlier, he had withstood a Nazi raid on his home in Vienna had fled to England, and would soon die of cancer of the jaw. Given those circumstances, he could not have been greatly amused by a crank with billiard ball eyes and a mustache as sharp as a scorpion's tail. Quote, contrary to my hopes, Dolly recalled of their meeting, we spoke little, but we devoured each other with our eyes. Dali, who was then in his mid-thirties, was already widely known for his critical paranoid paintings of dreams, in which limp watches are suspended from trees, giraffes have been set afire, and May West is a cushioned room interior. During his visit, Dali tried to convince Freud to look at an article that he had just published on paranoia. Opening the magazine, he begged Freud to read it not as a surrealist diversion, but as an ambitiously scientific article. Still, Dali reported, Freud continued to stare at me without paying the slightest attention to my magazine. Faced with what he later termed imperturbable indifference, Dolly made his voice grow sharper and more insistent. As the meeting ended, Dolly said, Freud continued to look at him with a fixity in which his whole being seemed to converge, then turned and said, in Dolly's presence to Stefan Zweig, the Austrian writer who had arranged the meeting, I have never seen a more complete example of a Spaniard. What a fanatic! 
How wonderfully appropriate, how dreamlike, that the painter of dreams should be incompatible with the father of dream analysis. No less appropriate, however, is the discovery that Dolly's interpretation of Freud's reaction was mistaken, and that Freud actually found their encounter that afternoon both pleasant and instructive. In other words, Dolly really was paranoid. I really owe you thanks for bringing yesterday's visitor, Freud wrote to Swag on the day after the meeting. For until now, I have been inclined to regard the Surrealists, who apparently have adopted me as their patron saint, as complete fools, let us say 95% as with alcohol. That young Spaniard, Dali, with his candid fantastical eyes and his undeniable technical mastery, has changed my estimate. If any encounter is more bizarre, any juxtaposition more radical, it may be the circumstances of 14 years later when Dali was briefly a visitor at the University of Northern Iowa, then called Iowa State Teachers College in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Two years after his meeting with Freud, Dali had moved to the U.S. where he lived and worked for 15 years, mostly in New York. Near the end of that period, having abandoned his critical paranoid stance, and having been renounced by his fellow Surrealists for his politics, he agreed to a series of lectures in which he toured the country with his wife Gala, giving slide and chalkboard talks about his new approach to art called nuclear mysticism. In 1952, Dali gave 10 presentations at schools and museums throughout the U.S., beginning with a lecture on revolution and tradition in modern painting at UNI on the evening of Wednesday, February 6th. His visit had been arranged by Herbert Hake, chairman of the college's Lecture Concert Series Committee, who had chosen Dali as a replacement for Edward R. Murrow, the celebrated CBS News analyst, who was unable to appear. Dolly was paid a then substantial speaking fee of $1,000. The only more expensive act was the Salzburg marionettes. He and Gala were accompanied by Mr. and Mrs. A. Reynolds Morris, a wealthy couple from Cleveland, Ohio, who owned 16 Dali paintings and who later established the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. They arrived from Chicago by passenger train on the evening of February 5th. They were housed in downtown Waterloo at the Russell Lampson Hotel, where it had been agreed that at 10 o'clock the next morning, Dali would hold a press conference. On Wednesday evening, more than 1,300 people gathered for Dali's lecture, which began at 8 p.m. in the auditorium of what is now Lang Hall. It was a huge audience for a small school, but dozens more might have attended, wrote Des Moines Register art critic George Shane, had it not taken place at the same time as an exhibition match by five Japanese Olympic wrestlers in the men's gymnasium across campus. During his slide illustrated lecture, Dali foretold the emergence of a new traditionalism which he was the leading practitioner of, wherein artists would abandon the then popular abstract expressionism. If you believe nothing, he said, you can paint nothing.
and return to traditional narrative art to spiritual classicism. It would be a second renaissance, Dali predicted, in which academic painting practices at which he excelled would close the gap between science and religion, between rationality and mysticism. In spite of a tremendous language barrier, reported the student newspaper, Dali's audience of faculty, students, and townspeople were both charmed and fascinated by his presentation. A Spaniard by birth, the article continued, Dali speaks English with a labored accent, seasoned with frequent French connectives and pronunciations. His colorful gestures, highly waxed mustache, distinctive cane, and ready wit added to his personal appeal. In the audience that evening was Lester Longman, head of the School of Art and Art History at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. When the talk ended, he asked Dali about the political leanings of another Spaniard, Pablo Picasso. Were Picasso's paintings influenced by communist doctrine? No, no, replied Dali. They cannot even be exhibited in Russia. Others wondered why an artist as famous as Dali had agreed to visit Iowa in the middle of winter. The answer, as it turned out, was that he had no grasp of the vastness of America. Looking at the map, Dali thought that Cedar Falls, Kansas City, Houston, and his other scheduled stops were only a brief train ride from Chicago. Also in the audience was the painter Paul R. Smith, a University of Iowa graduate who had recently joined the UNI art faculty. Before the lecture, Smith had deliberately, cleverly covered the speaker's table and lectern with brown craft paper in the hope that the artist might doodle or sketch inadvertently during the program. Unfortunately, as Smith recalled, sometime after the lecture that evening, when he went back to the auditorium to get the notes, scratches, and drawings, they had been disposed of by the maintenance people and lost. Later that evening, Smith and other UNI art faculty members, along with Longman and Shane, attended a party for Dali, which had been arranged by Harry Guillaume, the head of the art department. Hosted by Corley Conlon, a legendary senior member of the art faculty, the party was held at her unconventional self-designed Cherry Red Home, now owned by the Hearst Center for the Arts, on Searley Boulevard, just west of the corner of Searley and Main. There were no doors in the basement of Conlon's home so that she could host uproarious faculty parties in which everyone wore roller skates. Throughout the party, Smith remembers, Dali and Longman spent most of the time talking in French. Dali, of course, would start an English sentence and then end two-thirds of it in French. Dali said that he liked the Midwest because it reminded him of his Spanish homeland. The corn in Iowa, he explained, is the same as we have, except that ours is the red variety. We call it Arabian wheat, and the houses in Catalonia are beautiful when the ears are hung over the second floor balconies to dry. It was not Dolly's thick accent, but his distinctive rhinoceros hide cane, which he used as sort of a riding crop and pointer, that left the most lasting impression that day on Donald A. Kelly, and for good reason.
Kelly, who moved to Ohio after retirement, was a member at the time in the university's public relations staff. He was among a small group of local journalists who attended the press conference in Waterloo earlier that morning. During the question and answer period, Kelly asked Dali if art critics might think his shift from surrealism to nuclear mysticism could be a publicity ploy rather than genuine. The artist's alarming and sudden response was unforgettable. He glared at me, recalled Kelly, and he slammed his cane on the table. If he responded verbally, I don't remember what he said. Soon after, the session ended as the ex-surrealist painter gave a splendid example of the systemization of confusion. Wide-eyed, chin up, and adjusting the barbs of his mustache, he said, Myself disagrees avec everybody today. What a fanatic!